Hi guys, my name is Dan and welcome to another episode of CryptoLife. Today we'll be taking a look at the BAP project or better known as the BAX token. BAP is a blockchain banking project that many people have been hyping about recently. To learn more about BAP, keep watching this video. BAP describes itself as the world bank for the microeconomy. But what does that actually mean? The best way to describe the project would be to tell you about the features that they offer. The first feature they offer is they will offer a UK bank account that is compliant with UK regulations that will be made available to any person or business in the world instantly without the need for a UK address or credit history. To open such a UK bank account with BAP, all you need is a valid ID document such as your passport or national ID. With your UK BAP account, you will experience seamless transactions between legacy banking and your blockchain-based bank account. The way they do this is in addition to the usual cryptographic address, BAP accounts are issued with an IBAN or international bank account number for European and international bank wires, as well as an account number and sort code for UK national transactions. There is no physical bank for BAP. Everything is done via your BAP mobile application, which means that BAP allows businesses and individuals anywhere to control their money as long as they have an internet connection. They will also provide a payment card that is known as the black card that links directly with your BAP bank account. This is done via a QR code or NFC. So it allows both a debit-like function functionality and it can be issued as a prepaid card for your friends and family as well. Because this card works via the QR code, it does not need a chip, meaning it doesn't have to go through MasterCard or Visa. The BAP Black account is really the first of its kind. It contains no personal information on the card itself, which greatly improves card security. So if the card was lost, it can be easily unlinked from your bank account, which prevents anyone else from using it. Should you find your card again, all you need to do is simply scan the QR code on the card via your BAP app, and then it will link to your BAP bank account once again. If the card is lost permanently, new cards will be available very cheaply from certain major online retailers with next day delivery. Besides offering services for individuals, BAP will also offer services for the banks. So BAP believes that it's inevitable that central bank digital currency or CBDC or simply bank cryptocurrency will become a thing over the next decade. Their opinion was initially formed in 2005 and since then we have actually seen many announcements by central banks around the world each considering launching their own digital cryptocurrency. BAP will look to work with central banks in two ways. Firstly, integration with existing CBDCs. So BAP has an inter-blockchain approach that provides the infrastructure for banks to interact with other banks' existing CBDC or cryptocurrency. Banks looking to launch their own digital currency can also leverage BAP's technology to easily host and operate domestically a portion of the federated network. So basically, it's um, helping banks to easily launch their own cryptocurrency. And I think that this is a very smart project, guys. There are a number of banks considering launching their own cryptocurrency, and this is the first project I've heard that is providing a service to link them up, which I think will be very popular. Finally, data collected from the central banks on the platform can be or will be processed to provide more insights and recommendations for future upgrades. And there's more. Besides providing bank services, BAP even allows users, ourselves, to act as a bank and earn some extra money. Firstly, they allow a peer-to-peer -peer cash. So instead of ATMs, the mobile app will show users in your neighborhood proximity that you can contact to draw money from them should they wish to trade. So there's no actual ATM machines. Users like you and me become the ATM of the neighborhood. Next is peer-to-peer -peer borrowing. Users can lend and borrow from each other. Payment terms and rates are clearly defined, agreed on, and fast to conclude. Thirdly, there will be peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Advantages of using BAP to fundraise include, firstly, you can fundraise small amounts, less than $1 per participant. Secondly, it's a BAX token, so you can fundraise from across borders, across international, across different countries, and there will be no currency conversion. Thirdly, there is no middleman. Fourthly, it can be done privately, personally, that means within your family, or publicly, if open to anyone. 
And last of all, public fundraisers will need to be verified so that participant money cannot oh, or participant money will be protected. There is also a payment and payroll service where companies can easily automate payroll processing should they use BEP as their bank to pay their employees. So all this sounds great. There's lots of features. It's a very unique concept. And the great thing is that BEP is already an FCA authorized payment institute and they are in the process of applying for a banking license. If they do get the banking license, which they seem to think they will, it will be absolutely huge. Now let's take a look at their tag to see how they plan to achieve all these features with blockchain. To begin, their system design is one of a federated blockchain. For those who don't know what a federated blockchain means, think of it as a centralized blockchain. So all the nodes come under BEPS platform, which is the governance, but the big organizations like the central banks will also have their own little cluster of nodes of which they have specific jurisdiction over. So the whole governance is pretty much like a federal government and state government ruling. All the rules and processes are of course run with smart contracts. Any fiat funds that exist in legacy systems are represented by BEP tokens. It isn't an actual conversion, it is just represented. The transaction then happens in BEP tokens and fiat and is then paid out or collected into the BEP bank reserve. To collect and store a deposit in a bank reserve, they need the banking license and that's where it comes in. Now, because it's done with trusted smart contracts, account holders are in control of their own funds and can do transactions peer-to-peer -peer without the approval of any intermediary. That's where the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networking or market comes in. Next is privacy. Privacy is also protected as the only access to the user's identity is through a private key that is in the sole possession of the user on their device. So not even BAP has access to that data. Furthermore, they employ data encryption and cryptographic hashing as well as biometric identification. Biometric identification is things like a face and voice recognition to ensure privacy of the user. Now, relating to identification and signing up is their unique way of creating an account that they call a social KYC or know your customer. Generally, to create a bank account requires several documentation. You need an ID, you need the proof of address, you need your residency status, you need your credit status, etc. BEP employs an easy method of KYC to help everyone across the world to participate in this project. Basically, all you need is a photo of your passport or ID and a various forms of biometric. So you take your picture, send them your thumb, um, print, etc. And they will also have peer-to-peer -peer identity validation. So every user who has gone through the whole identity validation process, that verified user can vouch for other users on the platform, thus helping to validate their identity. So this makes it very easy for mass adoption of the project. Next is their token use. There will be a total of 50 billion BEX tokens. All services, fees, and licensing of the BAC platform uses BAX tokens under the hood. So if a user doesn't hold any BAX to operate on the platform, they can also easily purchase the amount needed, not just from exchanges, but from the bank itself. BAC platforms actually holds a lot of token use cases. I'm going to run through some of them. So for example, the central banks may charge a small fee for services they do, uh, such as lending or transferring money. There will be actual platform fees. So every time you open a new account, you send or receive a transaction, all of these will have a tiny platform fee. There will be licensing fees, fundraising fees, and also requesting access to a user identity information. This means that you hold your own identity, but if someone wants to have access to your identity or verify who you are, you will also get paid for just them using that information, which is great. Other use cases include onboarding and offboarding. So this is basically sending funds to and from an account and even international payments, etc. So this is definitely a currency or token that has use case and will have a demand on the platform. Besides the token use, there is also a token burn. So any tokens that are paid to operate the platform will be burned 50% and deleted forever. And this will continue to happen until the total amount of tokens in circulation hits 20% of the current total. So if you've got 50 uh, billion tokens, you expect to burn down all the way to 10 billion tokens in the end. 
The remainder are also frozen on the platform reserve so that it doesn't affect the market price for years. Furthermore, Bad Platform has also self-imposed restrictions on liquidating their funds in the reserve for the first five years. So every day, not more than 0.05 percent of the initial reserve can be made available for liquidation meaning so so you can buy bad tokens from the bank but up to a maximum of 0.05 percent so this sounds good and it means that they are careful about the token mechanics to prevent dumps and to ensure that both in the short and long term there will be token value and protection this is their team. It's a very decent sized team. Their CEO is Rashid Averos. He's a previous system engineer at Botch, a broker at Onda, CEO of WowPay Mobi, which is a payment institution, and a co-founder for Bafi UK, which stands for Banking Alliance for Financial Inclusion. The second person on your resume is their CTO, who is Jorge Pereira. He founded Signal in 2008, which is a world-class web application development firm. And in 2014, he joined Uphold as a CTO, where he was responsible for the design and architecture of the whole technology stack. In 2017, he founded FinTech Server and also startups Wayfax and Loyal Chain, all of this while being on board BAP. So that's quite impressive. Um, the rest of the team also have their LinkedIn profiles, which you can check out. But if I was to summarize it, I would say they are not heavy weights in the blockchain space specifically, but the team is also very young compared to some other projects, but they do have successful careers up to this point, all of them. Next is their board of advisors. This includes people like Abdi Ben Ari, who co-founded Applied Blockchain and a number of other blockchain startups, Peter Cox, who is the executive chairman of Contis Group, Thomas Brook, who is a US licensed attorney and technology executive, who also serves as the off counsel for emerging technology companies, innovators, and entrepreneurs. And there are more. And I'll be honest here, I don't actually recognize the names that uh, these people are involved with, but I must admit they are over in the UK, which is a very different part of the world for me. So maybe these companies are big over there and some of you might recognize them. The advisors definitely are older than the team and they do come across as more mature in the fintech arena based on their resume. There is no list of investors or partners which I was surprised for a project of this magnitude. And this is their roadmap and I was surprised with their roadmap but not in a good way. This is possibly the skimpiest roadmap I've ever seen. So usually you would expect to see a lot more detailed breakdown of milestones. For example, when the wallet is due, when the bank partnerships can be expected, rah, rah, rah. But those details are not here. The next milestone is half a year later in November with the app launch. So that's when we will see the first working product and that's a very significant milestone. The first quarter of next year, we will see another token sale. And the roadmap ends in the third quarter of next year with implementing advanced social KYC. And that's it. So it would be nice to see other features like when the black card is going to be released or when the peer-to-peer -peer lending and all those other additional features will be launched on the roadmap. Uh, so I must say the roadmap is a little bit disappointing. Roadmap aside, okay, when I was doing my research up to this point, I was thinking this is a really good project and I was getting really excited about the project. But then I came across a couple of things about the project that got me concerned. The first is about their upcoming equity sale. So they completed a 20 million ICO in February and an ICO is basically a fundraising to cover the cost of running every aspect of the project. And 20 million is an average ICO amount and it should definitely be enough to cover the cost for this project up to this stage. But a week ago, they announced that they will be having an equity crowd sale. So this is a separate fundraising uh, to put a deposit to get a bank license. They explained the need for a second fundraising because they didn't realize that the ICO money can't be placed as a deposit for bank license. I thought that this was a little bit careless because you are conducting a $20 million fundraiser without being sure initially of what you're using the funds for. Um, nonetheless, I took a closer look at the equity funding and that's where I got a little more uncomfortable. Now, buying an equity is basically buying a share of the company. So it's like buying shares on the stock market. It's not the same as the token where the token itself has no value in terms of the company's worth. With equity, the idea is that you have a voting right or say in the company. Now to start with, the equity sale is not a very large share of the company, it's only 2.5. So even if everyone voted for it or if you bought the entire 2.5, um, you, you would have a 2.5% right of say. Um, 
the company still holds 97.5%, so it's most likely they're still going to do what they want. Okay, um, They are aiming to waste 2.6 uh, pounds, 2.6 million pounds, sorry, uh, British pounds. And that is supposed to be 2.5% of the overall company valuation, which they have valued as 100 million um, pounds. The thing I'm uncomfortable with is how they evaluate the 2.5, which I think is not very fair to token holders. Let me explain a little bit more. So in their ICO phase, they sold 40% of their tokens for 20 million. So 100% of their tokens based on ICO valuation would be 50 million. So that gives them, um, yeah, 50 million. Now their current market cap is 44 million. So it's dropped a little bit, but not much. It's still kind of in the same ballpark kind of figures. But for their equity sale, in order to raise only 2.5 or sell only 2.5% of the company, they have self-valuated their company as 100 million pounds, meaning 136 million USD. So how do you jump up so much just in a couple of months? Nothing has actually changed. The tech hasn't changed. They haven't made new partners. No new product has been launched. How come your valuation of the company has suddenly um gone up so much that now the valuation of the company is more than three times the current market cap. You might say, oh, tokens is not the same as the valuation of the company. Fair enough, but tokens is representative of the company. It shouldn't be three times more. And there is no account of how they valuated the company. Now, if I want to sell a house that's worth a million dollars, I would need to get an external reputable appraiser to value my property. I can't just give my own subjective value. I think my house is worth $10 million. I need an external appraiser to value it for me. The same thing here. If they want to sell an equity, which is basically selling the shares of the company to make it a fair sale, they need to get an external reputable appraiser. They cannot just do it themselves and with no explanation of how they do it. They may give a few vague explanations. I would imagine like uh, we look at our tech and this and other aspects, but you know, you need someone to actually break it down very carefully and in a very fair way. I suspect that one of the reasons they may not have gotten an external appraiser is because the appraiser is likely to value it a lot lower. I mean, they, this is a very promising project. In the long term, they could be worth billions of dollars. But right now, okay, if I was an appraiser, I look at the project, it's still very young. They don't have many partners or big names behind them. They don't have a working product, you know. I, I don't know if I would value it as $136 million. Okay. Now, if you're working on the current market cap of $44 million, then $2.5 million, which they are trying to raise, is actually $3.4 million USD because the $2.5 million is in pounds, right? So when you convert it, it becomes $3.4 million. Now, $3.4 million USD out of a $44 million USD market cap equals to 7.7 percent okay so that's actually more than three times with the share the, or the the equity share that they're offering the market so investors in the equity sale could actually potentially be getting up to three times the share of the company that they would be getting if the company is being self-valuated at 100 million at the moment furthermore the company also um promises you that they will give you the share of the company, right? But what you got to ask yourself is what can you do with the shares, the equity of the company? As we pointed out above, the shares give you a negligible voting, right? So even if you bought all the 2.5 million worth, um, you, you, you still don't really get a say in where the project is going to go. And what a lot of people don't realize is that because this is a private company, you cannot sell your shares on the share market. So basically, once you buy the equity, you're kind of stuck with the shares and you can't actually do anything with it. I'll show you a clip from the recent Q&A so you know that I'm not making this up. Um, how can we sell? So um, when you buy equity in a private company like this, um, you can't sell it publicly, but you can, there's a kind of exchange transfer. that you can do. You can transfer equity to sort of friends and family or do an exchange and there might also be the option to sell back to the company at some point in the future. Um, so there you go. You buy thousands of dollars worth of shares that currently you can only trade with friends or family members and maybe in the future you can sell it back to the company but there's nothing in black and white to um, tie that down to that promise. There's no promise of dividends or any other things like that which you would usually get with uh, buying a, a big share of a big company. 
Some might say, oh, but you will get some BEX tokens when you buy the equity. Yes, you will, but the BEX tokens you get even with the airdrop potentially um, is not that much. And you can watch the rest of that video because they actually go on to say, if you were thinking of selling your BEX tokens to buy the equity, don't do it because you will get less BEX tokens. So if you're really um, hedging for the tokens, then it's much more worthwhile to just buy the BEX tokens on an exchange. And this fundraising is just a step to apply for a banking license. Many people seem to have the impression that once this fundraising is done, they will get the banking license. It's not a promise. Um, it's not that easy to get a banking license. You need to have a deposit before you can even apply for the banking license. And that's what this step really is. Um, so I hope that um, investors realize that Raising this equity fund doesn't equal to getting the banking license. There is still a risk involved, okay? Because if they don't get the banking license, you're not going to get your money back. And also, you got to realize that they are going to have another fundraising token sale again next year in the first quarter. So how many token sales exactly is this project going to have? Another aspect of the project that I guess I'm a little bit uncomfortable with is the human ATM aspect. Now, if we put money into the bank, our bank, whatever bank you use today, it is important for me to know that I can withdraw my money in cash any single time. Now, the only cash output or fiat output from the bad bank is through the ATM. They don't have a physical bank outlet or ATM machine to draw cash, to withdraw cash. Okay, It is only through the human ATM route, meaning if there's, there's no humans around you who own bad projects who have money on them, you can't actually withdraw your money in cash. Now let's imagine a simple scenario. Uh, I mean, every day people go to a bank outlet and withdraw thousands of dollars. Let's not talk about thousands of dollars. Let's talk about a simple scenario like buying an iPad. Let's say you want to buy an iPad, but the Apple store doesn't accept or recognize the black card yet. So you have to pay in cash. So you have to withdraw $1,000 cash from somewhere. And if I send you $1,000 worth of BEX token today, how confident are you that you can go out into the street and find another BEX users within 50 meters or even 100 meters or even 200 meters around you who has $1,000 cash in their wallet who will be willing to give it to you because the person is carrying $1,000 cash around for no reason, he just carries it around to be a human ATM. How many of you would carry $1,000 around for no particular reason? Furthermore, if I was a user and I did have the money in my wallet, I would be thinking, why would I ever want to be your ATM? Because the only thing I get from you back is back tokens, which I can just get from the exchanges at exactly the same rate. Also, if you look at the app uh, interface, which I've shown on the screen, it actually shows the profile pictures of people in the vicinity who have the amount of money requested. In this case, they requested $300 and there's uh, nine sample profiles up on the picture, on a GPS picture. Now, no way do I want to announce to the whole neighborhood that I'm carrying like a thousand dollars or significant amount of money on me and place my picture so they can identify me and my GPS location on an app that they can track me. It will be so easy for robbers to use this app to target individuals to rob. So I like my privacy. I don't want to unnecessarily interrupt whatever I'm doing. Why would I be a human ATM? And again, the human ATM is the only way you can get cash or fiat out directly from the system immediately. There is no bank outlet or actual ATM machine to do so. Converting to BEX token or going through a crypto exchange and then transferring to your bank would take a matter of days and it would cost a number of transaction fees as well. But that would take time. There's no way to get cash out immediately. And this model also means that they will take a long time before they can build up a user base that can sustain these human ATM models if they can ever do that. And it will also mean that people in smaller cities and towns uh, are, will be totally unable to cash out their holdings. Personally, I don't think that this feature is a good feature. Finally, I'm going to end by taking a quick look at the price. The BEX token now is extremely cheap in my, op my own opinion. The token cost is 0.2 cents, but more than that, their yeah, market cap is only 44 million. Okay, it's very, very small. They are only on tiny exchanges at the moment like Bangkok. They haven't even hit the mid-sized exchanges like KuCoin. There's a lot of hype on this project, which we all know is what drives token prices currently. 
And I mean, with a market cap of 44 million, it has so much room to grow. This project, if it takes off and achieve what they want to achieve, it could be worth billions in future. So we're talking you no know, potential 50 to 100x returns. But high returns also means high risk. In the short term, I, I feel quite confident they will go up as the market goes up. But in the long term, I think there is a significant risk that this of whether or not this project will succeed. I hope they do. I think they will. But, you know, they don't have a working product yet and they do have uh, potential hiccups, in my opinion. And um, they still have a lot of major milestones that they haven't crossed yet. So um, just because it's so early still in its development stage, it's so conceptual in its development stage, I think that there's a significant element of risk still. I'm also not really a fan of their equity crowd sale model, as you probably realize by now. Okay, I think that I honestly think it's not a fair deal to the investors. And I strongly feel, really strongly feel, they should get an external appraiser that's independent of the whole project to do an appraisal before the crowd sale is launched. And the thing that makes me very uncomfortable is that if it really is an unfair valuation, it was done intentionally by the company, who are the ones who are intentionally self-determining their value. It's not an accident. Also, the amount of BEX token that is given to each investor from the equity token investment is also not clear. So I personally don't understand why people or anyone would invest in something where the returns are not spelled out in black and white clearly. I always thought that was one of the red flags for investment. But the concept of the project on the whole is a good concept. Okay, It's unique, uh, it's something that the market needs. And the team seems genuine and capable with mature advisors. So there's good and bad in terms of my review of this project. None of this is professional advice, of course, just my own thoughts. So always do your own research and make your own decisions. Just be careful not to FOMO into a project. And you will know and recognize the FOMO crowd because FOMO crowds will always talk only about the good points. They can't be neutral enough to see the potential negatives and they even become hostile when you uh, suggest any negatives about a project. Pointing out negatives doesn't rule out a project as a bad project. Everyone makes mistakes. No project is perfect. Negatives don't make a project bad. It's how a team responds to the negatives that will show the attitude of the team. And that is what determines the final outcome of a project, whether or not a team can take a negative and correct it to become a positive. So I'm certainly looking forward to seeing where BAP as a project on the whole goes in the future, because as a concept, again, I really like this project. If you liked this video or found it helpful, do give us a like and subscribe and also do join our Telegram group where we point out new projects worth paying attention to like this one. So thank you so much for hanging out with us. Have a great day wherever you are and we will catch you next time.